with us today, and welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. So you have a really interesting background. I was reading about that um, banking. You are a venture capitalist. You're an entrepreneur in residence, a technologist. So I was wondering if you might share your background and your story and what led you eventually to, to found AirPR. Sure. Happy to. So um, way back in the glory days, uh, I spent a lot of time growing up as a hockey player and ended up going to college to play hockey. And the issue was I was also a huge geek. So I majored in computer science. Uh, I went to Princeton and spent most of my life playing with computers and figuring out that I wanted to do that over playing hockey. And so yeah. ended up joining a tech startup called Appian. Uh, we created the first complaints tracking system for the Department of Homeland Security. Um, was, was that out here on the West Coast? Uh, actually, that was in the East Coast. That was in Washington, D.C. And uh, ironically now, if you end up going to an airport and you want to file a complaint against a TSA screener, it goes to the system that we built. That That's I you guys. Manage. <laughs> yeah. That uh, I believe is still there uh -huh. um, after a decade. And uh, ended up uh, getting an MBA from Harvard. And uh, I was a... Uh, at J.P. Morgan, uh, in between my first and second year of business school, and just missed the startup, uh, startup atmosphere. And interestingly enough, ended up jumping into banking because I figured out I wanted to learn about the space. And when I was in college, I was uh, in an econ 101 class taught by some no-name professor called Ben Bernanke. And, <laughs> oh, uh, that we, guy. We've yeah. heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> We've heard of him. And I was like, oh, supply demand seems pretty easy. I'll figure this out later. And uh, ended up uh, jumping at JP Morgan, did banking, and realized I just missed the startup world. Mm -hmm. And if I could have access to multiple startups, it would be a great fit. So that led me to venture capital. And uh, I was really lucky to connect with some wonderful uh, different VC groups um, and ended up uh, jumping, uh, in jumping in and, and, and joining and joining, uh, Air, uh, joining Sierra Ventures. And I worked under oh, sure. Peter Wendell. And... Mm -hmm. uh, I was a VC for, sourced my first deal in about three months, company sold about uh, 13 months later, and wow. uh, had a really exciting taste of what uh, it was like to That's a it. great first run for VCs, how many can say that after 13 <laughs> months, right? Yeah. Hey, so, so what happened so to what the happened career, to career in, uh, in uh, uh, ice hockey? Uh, ice hockey. Uh, uh, so that, uh, when I, that's an aside, but happy to jump into it. So after I ended up receiving a couple offers to go play in the NHL, mm. um, Really? Yeah. So I had a couple of different agents that were going through the process of talking to me to uh, to sign me, mm -hmm. and I realized that uh, I wanted to follow my passion, and I just wasn't passionate about playing hockey anymore, and uh, I didn't want to do something just for the money. And uh, uh, my parents, who have been super supportive of everything I've done my entire life, um, were very loving in their response, but they said, why don't you just f do this for a year? You can make $3 million here, and then you can follow your passion. Right. What's not to love about yeah. hockey? Yeah, what's not to love about hockey? And so ended up, uh, they came to visit me, and one of the, the, the final pushes was I was at a dinner with them, and there was an agent at the dinner, and I listened mm -hmm. to a four-hour sales pitch and Golly. just decided wow. they didn't want to do it anymore. But uh, one, of the, one of the side benefits of that decision is you have all your teeth. That's, that's right. <laughs> You're still getting knocked around, just a right. different context. That's right. Yeah. Four to five, uh, Lots of learnings there. That's right. Four to five dentists recommend you play hockey. So it actually works out pretty well. <laughs> well, that's an amazing set. So at, when you were a banker, were you like a technology banker? Was that the experience that you were lining up and then eventually ended up as a venture capitalist? Yeah. So I was doing uh, technology M&A, so mergers mm -hmm. and acquisitions um, in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, the entire time, a wonderful group of people, I just, I wanted to be on the other side of the equation. I wanted to be closer to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't have a great idea at the time. But I figured that if I could put myself as close to the brilliant entrepreneurs as possible, eventually I would strike off and do my own thing. So approximately what time frame was that? In the this is in uh, 2007 is when I was at J.P. Morgan, right at the peak of the bubble, just mm -hmm. about to watch it collapse. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, so also great experience, right? <laughs> just seeing the way, I mean, just understanding, having seen that and being in that moment and then right. from here then to now. So I'm, I'm curious, and maybe it's I should d delay the question for a little bit, but I'll ask it anyway. So what brought you to the West Coast. What is it about the Bay Area that you couldn't find in uh, New York? Yeah, so in, in 2007, 2008, 
Uh, if you wanted to go in investment banking, you go to New York. It's right. the epicenter of it. And right. if you wanted to start a company or go into venture capital, you come to Silicon Valley. It's the epicenter of it. Um, it things have changed. It's, it's still the epicenter out here, but now you have startup hubs in New York City. Right, huge right, hub, right. obviously. And there's different hubs growing in each part, uh, each parts of the uh, of the country. But back in 2007, 2008, this is where the action was. Right. And so I ended up moving out here to, to go into venture capital. Uh, and that's when it first uh, first began for me. It was uh, was working at Sierra Ventures. After that happened, um, the exit happened. I went through the whole process of saying, ultimately, I, I want to start a company. And if I'm ever going to do it, I might as well do it now uh, when I have a lot more free time than I'm ever going to have as right. compared to the rest of my life. So, Sharon, this is a bit of a, of a tangent, but let me go down this path. There are a lot of people um, that we that Irina and I run into who want to know how do they get into venture capital and you somehow made the transition out of the investment banking business into Sierra Ventures which is a very well known and well regarded VC firm here in in Silicon Valley I mean did you have how did you do that by the way uh, that was really hard um, one of the things they took a poll of our class and there's 900 people in our MBA class and they asked who would who is looking for a job in venture capital or would like a job in venture capital? And the response was about 50%. Uh, so 450 people. That was just in our class. And I wow. believe that year there were yeah. nine new jobs. Right? <laughs> and so it, it was probably one of the hardest jobs that I've ever had to get. And ultimately, like anything, if you really want something, you have to hustle and get it. And so what I ultimately ended up doing was a combination of being too naive to know that I couldn't do it. And so trying it anyway, but right. every time I would chat, I made a list of all of the people that I knew that uh, either had a, a role or knew a venture capitalist and would meet with as many people as I could. And at the end of it, I would ask, oh, who do you think that I should connect with? Ask for a couple different names. And then from there, it kind of spirals out. And pretty soon I had a network of about 200 different VCs that I'd met with. Wow. And ultimately, uh, no venture capital firm is ever hiring, but they're always hiring. They're looking right. for the one right person. If they happen to find it, they'll make room for them. And uh, that was how ultimately at the end, all of this caught together when I connected with Sierra, I connected with Excel. Uh, even back then, I was uh, Mike Maples was just forwarding, forming oh, his, Floodgate. Yeah, Floodgate. Yeah, yeah. before yeah. even form Floodgate. It was Mike was just raising, I believe, his second fund at the time. Wow. So these are some of the folks that I was chatting with and getting to the final conversations. Well, that's remarkable Amazing. because especially during that time, I mean, the VC firms were definitely in a state of, uh, they were hunkering down. I mean, this was when the world was in financial flames and here you are out you know, with your hat in hand looking for a job in, in the Bay Area. Yeah. Also, to his point, like hustling, like grit yeah. and perseverance, and also like a mindful approach and reaching out to folks that you yeah. knew or were meeting. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's very different from entrepreneurship, uh, but it has a lot of similarities in that. Mm -hmm. In VC, it's really hard to get into as opposed to entrepreneurship. It's really easy. Anyone can be an entrepreneur, but there's just the massive rate of failure. Right, yeah. um, right, right. But they purposely set up VC to be uh, very difficult to get into because they want to see that you're going to hustle around, find connections, figure out a way to get to them. And it's very similar to when you go to raise capital for your own company. And they want to see that you'll find a trusted introduction to them. You'll want to see that, that you spend the time doing research about them. The way that I met Peter Wendell mm -hmm. um, is that I spent a lot of time Googling his name, talking to people that actually knew him. And I found that there was a case study written about him when he had gone to school. And I I read the case study, um, or I tried to read the case study. It wasn't available online. I had to buy it. it took three weeks to get there because yep. it wasn't available yep. electronically. Oh, yeah. yep. <laughs> Sent him an email out of the blue and referenced the case study and kind of gently teased him about a part of it, but said I would love to get a chance to meet him and that I was going to be in California um, in four days and if he had any open time. And he said, yes, I'm, I'm available this date. And at that point is when I bought my ticket to go out to California. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah. So. Well, that's a great a great story of perseverance. I, I mean, I agree. It that's what it takes to to break down that wall. It's hard to get into venture capital for sure. And yet, when you got in, you also had a success. You were mentioning a company that you sourced and invested in had an outcome in 13 months, which is uncommon for folks who are listening. That's kind of probably an outlier. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say that that's the norm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, a company called Makara, mm -hmm. and uh, they were doing a platform as a service. Um, that allowed you to take any app, move it to the cloud, and uh, they wrapped it in as a platform as a service that provided enterprise level monitoring, management, and logging capabilities. Wow. And this is in 2008 that we found it. Um, so I think sourced it about three months in. 
Um, got a chance to sit on the board of that company and then another one I was helping out um, at Sierra. So it's just a fascinating experience okay. watching things at the, at the board level. And then after that, you were an entrepreneur in residence at somewhere at Shasta. And it was that at that point you were making the transition in your mind like now I've had some venture capital experience. You still had an eye toward entrepreneurship and that's kind of where you're trying to direct yourself. Yeah. So after after that happened, I said, really want to start a company. Um had a couple different folks that we co-invested with at, with Makara. So Shasta Ventures was one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark and Ben, so Mark and Dreesen and Ben Horowitz, uh, before they formed Dreesen Horowitz, were doing these 50K angel deals. And so there were others. Uh, and so we got to know these folks as they were really starting the starting their firms. And uh, started talking about a little bit I wanted to focus on. Had a couple offers and ended up joining Shasta as an entrepreneur in residence, uh, which means I got to kick around a lot of the different ideas for companies I wanted to start. And I got paid for it, which uh, was really... Uh, lucky to be able to be given that opportunity. And so the only thing I asked them was for, in addition to an office, was a huge whiteboard. Yeah. And I had, I wrote down every single different sector that I was at all remotely interested in, even some some that I weren't. Um, and my investment thesis was that if in 2008, 2009, social was similar the way the internet was in 99, 2000. Uh, it was the wild, wild west. Right. Right. People right. knew yeah. it was going to be enormous, but no one really knew how to harness it. And the thought was if you could cross-sect social with a variety of different uh, industries, you'd hit on one and create an entirely new business model. And um, the one that had been successful at the time was Groupon, but it was still p- pretty early, but it, it was clearly a success. And the thought was there's a lot of potential opportunities in other spaces that might be interesting to leverage social. And so as I was kicking around these ideas, I was coding up uh, different solutions to some of these problems that I was facing. And uh, more and more, they would ask for help for their portfolio companies with uh, social media. And so now, now this was at Shasta? This is at Shasta, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so they'd ask for help with social media in terms of their portfolio companies, and then some of those portfolio companies would ask for help with PR. And mm-hmm. pretty soon I was like, why are you asking me? There's a whole industry of people that can focus on this. Yeah. Right. And the more and more I talk about the problem, I realized that it was not faced just by the Shasta portfolio company, it was by a lot of entrepreneurs. And a good friend of mine at the time turned to me and he's like, you know, there's seems like there's a real opportunity here in PR that you should focus on. And because he was a good friend of mine, I completely ignored him and continued <laughs> doing exactly what I was doing. Um, and over and over again, I was hit on the head with this problem. And if we could apply technology to a space that hadn't had it uh, in the past, you could really, really benefit everybody in there. And so that was where the idea for Air PR was formed, and we then created the Air PR Marketplace, which connects the top 1% of PR consultants in the country with companies looking for their services, and that was uh, recently acquired by the CHR Group. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, product was the Air PR Analyst, and that is the way to measure the impact of your PR for companies from early stage all the way up to Fortune 100 businesses. And uh, that's the, the the opportunity that we think is enormous because right now, no one knows how PR impacts the bottom line, and if we can solve that pain point for them, uh, it has enormous potential. So, so why don't we pause here for those of you who are just now dialing in? Our guest this hour is Sharon Falagra Mercer. This is Doug Collum. I'm here with my co-host Irina Yen, and we're talking to Sharon, who's the um, uh, who was an EIR, an entrepreneur in residence at Shasta Ventures, and just by coincidence, it's a small world. Uh, Rob Conybeer, who is a partner at Shasta, also happens to be a co-host on a different Sirius XM business radio program by the name of Launchpad. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's a small community. Actually, when I saw this, Sharon, that you were um, an EIR at Shasta, um, I was struck by that. Yeah, and he's a Wharton alum. You know, one, one question, just there, there are people listening who may not understand what an entrepreneur in residence does at, when they're parked at a venture capital firm. I have this conception of kind of like being a bee in a flower garden where you get a chance to look at a lot of different companies and and evaluate business models and sectors and so forth. And then I think a lot of folks in that position take the opportunity to, to jump off onto a flower for a more permanent position. Is that Was that your experience? Yeah, so there's two different kinds of EIRs. There's executives in residence and entrepreneurs in residence. And the executives in residence traditionally are the ones that leverage that platform, find a portfolio company that either the, the venture capital firm is going to invest in or that 
might be the right fit for them to contribute to and ultimately find a, a, a flower to jump onto. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the entrepreneur in residence traditionally is the one that's trying to find a business, uh, sorry, try to start a business from scratch. And uh, it's interesting because you end up sitting in on the Monday morning meetings, having conversations, giving your opinion on spaces that you might be an expert in, but also talking to as many entrepreneurs as possible. Because at the end of the day, you might have an idea of a general space that you might want to start something in, Mm -hmm. but you're staring at the exact uh, situation of where it was not the case. I thought I was going to start something in a completely different space. And even when a even when hit on the head with this uh, potential pain point, I still completely ignored it because I didn't understand the potential of it. Yeah, And so like any entrepreneur, you can either completely be an expert in one space and try to figure out where there is pain in that space and try to solve it, or you go to where there is pain and figure out where that space might be. Right. And so there's a couple different ways to approach it. So that's interesting. So, so here you are in, in EIR. You come up with this idea. Your, your kind of friend hit you. Didn't hit you over the head with the pan yet, but I guess eventually did. Um, and then, so you start this technology platform, which is that you started to describe a technology platform in the PR domain, which sounds astounding because of t- the ability to apply analytics or to be able to measure how a PR campaign or strategy can work seems pretty. Like, like a disconnect. So can you explain like how the technology or the solution works and then how, how, how it's going? Yeah, so we grab all kinds of content uh, across the world. So new, every single news article, blog post, whether it's a thought leadership piece, content marketing, marry that with the company's social media data to surface the most authoritative and or impactful coverage or content for their business or their brand and tie that in and determine, hey, what business objectives do you care about? Is it potential customers, is it revenue, whatever it may be, and being able to show from an individual news article all the way down to how it's affected a customer coming to your website that may or may not even download a white paper or buy something. Combining that with the ability to determine how your PR efforts, how that content has affected your brand awareness, how it's changed brand lift for you, and ultimately how it's affected your SEO. Uh, 92% of all B2B buying decisions start with an online web search. And so PR is a great fit for helping navigate and showing the unbiased third-party opinion Mm -hmm. to any potential customer that's doing that research. And so bringing that trifecta together of the direct aspect of PR, which is long-term driving potential customers, all the way to brand awareness, all the way to SEO. Uh, And we've come up with a a term that we have designated as news engine optimization or NEO and how PR affects SEO. We just trademarked that. I mean, I'd like to ask a basic question about marketing. So my my background is not marketing. To me, there's always a question of cause and effect. You have an input at one end of the spectrum and there's an output at the other end of the spectrum. And if marketing were a science, you could actually establish a one-to-one correlation. Somebody runs a news article and suddenly your revenue goes up. But life isn't that simple. There are lots of other inputs. And the, the question is, what, which particular input actually caused your revenue to jump? I mean, I, t- to me, it's a, it's, this is an issue that is both frustrating for my position here at Wharton, and I'm intrigued to hear how you're going to respond to this. <laughs> Yeah, you so, didn't know you were pitching, huh? Right, right. No, this, this is great. So we've uh, been approached by a lot of different universities as well. So we're seeing a lot of different interesting angles. So naturally, you have large brands. Um, we started to get approached by celebrities um, or their agents uh, because celebrities themselves are their brand. Self-branding. Exactly. Yeah. And they yeah. want to know when they go to negotiate the contract for the next deal for Kevin Hart, how he is, how he performs against Ice Cube, for example, um, and how they can negotiate that contract mm-hmm. and how much money that they can actually you know, go through that process of negotiating. And the other one is universities, which is fascinating. So we've started to get approached by a lot of universities, in particular ones that have a brand or spend money on, on PR. And ultimately caring about how when a customer is or a client or a student has read an article, what are the different inputs that may go into that person or that individual ultimately coming to Wharton's website to learn a little bit right. more. Right, exactly right. And, Thank you for, for phrasing the question more correctly. Yeah. And, <laughs> and ultimately, 
there are multiple touch points that you generally need. You know, there's one-off situations in which someone might respond to an ad. Obviously, this isn't the case with a warrant, but someone might respond to uh, just reading a news article, mm-hmm. or whatever it may be. But we ultimately filter out the online advertisements that might occur. We filter out a lot of the different metrics. We filter out seasonality. We filter out a lot of the different things that individuals might go through the process of seeing in terms of those touch points to Mm -hmm. say, oh, this is definitively going to be as a result of this individual news article. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's no 100% perfect answer with all of this. But right now, in terms of measurement, PR is probably 5% of where it should be. And if we can take it 80 or 90% of the way there, then we'll have done our job exceptionally Mm -hmm. well. 5% 5% in terms of what it's able to capture and measure? Yeah, so right right now, the way that uh, in PR that we are able to measure is we leverage either clip counting, which is the concept of saying, you're a large brand, here are the news sources that you've been covered in. Mm-hmm. And you don't know the value of that to your business. Um, the other one is saying, here's an advertising value equivalent, which says, let's pull out your ruler and pull out the newspaper ad, measure the size, or the newspaper article, measure the size of the newspaper article with your ruler, and look at that on a rate card, and determine how much that was to cost, and say, all right, this news article is worth that. Uh, And whenever you're pulling out a a ruler to measure anything these days, you're probably, uh, it's slightly archaic. Yeah, scratching Uh, your head a little bit. Yeah, yeah. and the last one is an impressions calculation. Um, And in an advertisement, when you see an impression, or when you hear about an impression, that's someone that's on the website that has theoretically seen the ad. Now, in uh, PR, an impressions calculation is put out a press release, it gets picked up by Yahoo Finance, Yahoo Finance has 20 million uniques a month, 20 million people uh, that visited a month. Therefore, we got you 20 million impressions. And so you have no idea if anyone's read the news article uh, or the press release or whatnot. And so those numbers don't really show how it benefits your bottom line. So in the case for Air PR, you have a product Air PR analyst. So does that product go one layer deeper, where it can kind of nudge the 5% beyond that? Like given whether, is it because it's different inputs? Is it if you're screening out and indexing, if you will, kind of the data screening out the noise so you get like the 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 dense kind of actual data, the impact, that sort of thing? That's exactly right. So looking at every single piece of data that we can get our hands on, we process about 10 terabytes of data every wow. day in order to determine how influential people are that are talking about you, um, how individuals that are reading the article are actually interacting with you in some way, shape, or form, Mm -hmm. um, how they're engaging with you, uh, which social media influencers are amplifying your message, what are the key messages that are actually getting picked up by media and amplified um, socially, Um, how you fare against your competitors. We spend a lot of time talking about, oh, this is your brand, but who are the two or three or four or five competitors that you really look at, whether they're aspirational brands that you want to be like, or they're actually competitive brands from a PR standpoint or from a business standpoint, and let's look at all the coverage that they are getting Mm -hmm. and start to drill down and say, oh, they're actually being covered by these publications and you're not. How do we show you some of that data so you can change that? You can ping the, the journalist that's writing about your space, and it sounds like they just don't know who you are because they're already writing about your competitors. Right. And so these are some easy things that you can leverage our solutions to drive uh, insights for your business. So, so can you clarify, so if a customer wants to engage Air PR, or really to optimize its PR campaign, it's a two-step process. You, you, you retain a PR firm to manage media relationships and so forth, and then they retain Air PR because that's the, the, the data backbone. That's how you evaluate whether or not the use of the PR campaign is being effective. Is that approximately right? Yeah, and a lot, a lot, yes, and a lot of companies will actually hire a PR firm uh, or they will do all their PR in-house. Mm-hmm. And we are the data backbone, exactly as you say, because without data, you can't measure anything. Right. And so the industry has not only not had measurement, but it hasn't had the data before. So we're creating that data backbone, that, a data backbone and mm-hmm. layering the measurement on top of there. Okay. Um, if you're just joining us, I'm Irina Yen, along with my co-host, Doug Collum. Our guest this hour is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Air PR, Sharam Faladgar Mercer. Stay with us as we continue our conversation. Uh, you're listening to Bay Area Ventures on business radio, powered by the Wharton School on Sirius XM Channel 111. 
Hey, it's Ron Bennington from Sirius XM's Raw Dog Comedy Hits. Join me for my new show, Bennington, that I co-host with Gail Bennington. No relation. We'll be talking to the biggest names in comedy every single day, from the best and brightest rising young comics to the greatest of all time. Nothing touched the crowd like our comedy. That so just blew up for you. The comedy just worked. Bennington, weekdays, noon east, 9 a.m. west, on Raw Dog Comedy Hits, Sirius XM 99, or listen on the Sirius XM app. Hi, I'm Randy Zuckerberg, former executive at Facebook, editor-in-chief at Doc Complicated, and now host of my own show on Sirius XM. I'm a woman, a businesswoman, entrepreneur, author, and a friend. Join me every week as we talk about technology, social media, innovations for kids, parents, even pets. Most importantly, join me so we can have some fun. Call me. Let's talk. Let's get inspired. Every Wednesday at noon east on Business Radio, Sirius XM 111. On MLB Network Radio, you'll hear the latest news and expert analysis of America's national pastime. This is shocking news. Interviews with all-stars, managers, and executives. Mike Trout. David Ortiz. Play-by-play of the biggest games. And one of the most remarkable games you will ever see. On-site broadcast from baseball's most important moments. Down here in the clubhouse, champagne is flowing. MLB Network Radio, Sirius 209, XM89, and the Sirius XM app. Professor Barbara Kahn. I'm the director of the J.H. Baker Retailing Center, and I'm the Patty and J.H. Baker Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School. My job is to provide the science, the theory, what's going on, and then ask, in this case, even listeners, to think about, well, what does that mean to you? And what would be the next step? Redefining problems, putting structure and framework on this amorphous, hard-to-understand world. Professor Barbara Kahn, host of Marketing Matters, Wednesdays at 5 p.m. East on Business Radio, Sirius XM 111. The number one hits with the number one voice of the 70s. This is Casey Kasem in Hollywood on American Top 40. Every weekend, we replay a different countdown from the same week in the 70s. And we're heading for a brand new number one song. You can tell the American Top 40 Countdown this is the song with Casey Kasem. Every Saturday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific with replays through the weekend on Sirius XM 70s on 7. 7. Business Radio, powered by the Wharton School. Sirius XM brings you the first channel with direct access to the world's top business minds as they give you practical advice and information on real-world business issues. Learn how to launch a business, find investors, hire and motivate employees, and use social media. Hear the keys to innovation and staying ahead of the competition. Plus, the newest ideas from Silicon Valley. Unprecedented access to the world's top business minds. Call and ask your questions. Business Radio, powered by the Wharton School. Sirius XM 111. This is Don Butler, Executive Director of Connected Vehicle and Services for Ford. You're listening to Business Radio, powered by Wharton, Sirius XM 111. Welcome back to Bay Area Ventures on Sirius XM's Business Radio, powered by the Wharton School. I'm your host, Irina Yen, Director of Wharton Entrepreneurship here at Wharton San Francisco. And I'm here along with my colleague and co-host, Doug Collum, Vice Dean at Wharton San Francisco. Our guest this hour is Sharon Faladga Mercer, the co-founder and CEO of AirPR. And when we left off, we were just starting to talk about how, if a customer is interested in working in AirPR, how does that work? Do you work directly with the clients? Do they work through their agency to work through AirPR? Yeah, so we work with both agencies and large brands. Um, so it just depends on what is most comfortable for uh, for that company or the agency. So we'll work with the agency that will say, hey, we have uh, a Fortune 100 brand that's looking at PR measurement, and uh, we want to offer them a solution that shows both us as being innovative and can help them solve their problem because there isn't a solution out there right now in the market. Uh, or we'll work directly with the brands. And so it ranges from early stage tech companies. Um, one of our clients just got purchased by Apple, which is kind of- uh, That's exciting. Which is, which is yeah. exciting. All the way up to uh, really large organizations um, such as the New York Stock Exchange, all the way to Fortune 100 companies like Rackspace. Wow. And so we work across the spectrum with, uh, with companies of all sizes and, and stages. Uh, and we have a SaaS solution, a software as a service mm-hmm. solution right. with one, two, or three-year contracts. Well, how, 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 go ahead. I was going to ask, how does a startup work with you, for example? Um, I guess is a two-part 
question in a way, like how do they work with you from a resource standpoint? Because if they're pre-funded or seed or early stage funding, they're making choices about investment dollars in general, growth, you know, hires and all that kind of stuff. And and how do they work with you in terms of framing the strategy? Do they work with you kind of as, in an advisor kind of relationship and you help frame the problem so that you can then, the technology can help solve? Yeah, it's a, it, what we try to do is first, if it's a really early stage company and it's either been bootstrapped or seed funded, um, they've rest, raised less than a million dollars. Traditionally, they should focus either on doing PR themselves in house or try to find a really cost effective consultant because you traditionally can't afford to spend twenty five thousand, fifty thousand dollars on a PR agency. Right. And mm -hmm. finding that PR independent, uh, that PR professional to really help them at a cost effective price point is really where we focused their PR marketplace on helping them solve that resource. And so once they get to a certain size and, and scale and have revenues coming in and have a PR agency or they're doing or they're spending money on PR in house, that's when we can come in and say, here's the data uh, that underpins mm -hmm. how PR is performing in different areas that you care about or different campaigns that you're focused on. And as a result, you can take the data, we can now measure it and show where the impact is really most beneficial. And so you can double down on those maybe second tier publications that are vertically focused on the clients that you care about, that you weren't aware that drove that much engagement um, versus some of the other things that you're doing that might not drive as much engagement. When was the company formed? 2011. And so how's it going so far? Uh, it's been great. We have clients that, uh, uh, range to some of the business, biggest businesses in the world. Um, it's always amazing when we get a tour of the New York Stock Exchange floor as an early stage company. And I'm like, this is amazing. I feel like we're here a little early, but uh, That's you know, exciting. Being, being able to sign those yeah. kinds of yeah. clients is, is really exciting and motivating to us. And one of our first products was just acquired. And so it's, we've-, we've That was Marketplace, is that, that was the right? Marketplace, yeah. exactly. And so- We've, we've seen a lot through the stage of the company and it's been really exciting. So Sharon, just to throw the question back on you, how do you do your PR? How do you get, how does, I mean, it's a more general question. How does an early stage company achieve that level of buzz necessary to attract business, to attract clients? Yeah, so one of the things that we've really focused on is brand. And generally, you we used to always recommend either as a VC firm or whenever giving advice to entrepreneurs, traditionally you'd start that when you're 50 million in revenue, 100 million in revenue. We started on day one. And so one of the focus areas we had is we hired Rebecca Iliff as our chief strategy officer and Rebecca started one of the fastest growing PR firms in the country. She also writes for Mashable, mm -hmm. Huffington Post, Inc. Magazine, uh, PR Week. So she is um, both an expert in the space, but also is a thought leader in the space. And that helped really define our brand and help really shape our product to not just be a technology in search of a problem, but really understand the problem and build technology to solve that problem. The second thing we did is helped create an ecosystem. And I think that's one of the things that's really lacking when companies hit $100 million in revenue. Um, it's the thing that takes them to the next, to a, to a billion dollar business. And the ecosystem that we help form is PR tech. And much like the ad tech world or the ad tech space, this is the PR version of that. And there's a lot of different companies in the space doing everything from content to measurement. Um, and We've really been hyper-focused on making sure that uh, a lot of different groups have voices in that space and doing awards ceremonies for it and making sure we highlight a lot of the great organizations or a lot of the great companies that are applying technology to improve PR. So you founded PR Tech as a group? It was, one of, the, it was one of the things that uh, we were a founding member of. Yeah, so we... That's great. This was in, a few years ago, actually, the first article about it came out in VentureBeat. And uh, ever since then, we've done our best to help push that ecosystem forward. And so we were one of the creators of it. Wow. It's creating the, um, yeah, the, sta the industry standard, if you will, for the industry. Um, one of the questions that I had was, um, how do you do? So do you work with you partner with agencies versus competing, or because the nature of some of these relationships is that you work directly with them also, and in some cases like evaluating the PR performance. So how has that been navigating that? Yeah, and, and one of the things we do is we never will highlight the performance of the agency. We will really show the areas where PR has been very impactful and the areas where 
PR can focus on improving. And it helps because no one's perfect at everything. And there's always room for improvement no matter what we're doing. But to be able to take this product and show off to your boss how well you're doing in a particular area that you care about, um, and then also being able to generate insights from it to do your job more effectively is how we really position this as a win-win for everybody. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it, it shows, gives you the ability to showcase what data you want to your executive team, while at the same time generating the insights that you care about to be as effective as you can in your job and your capacity. Because at the end of the day, you have so much data coming at you from all facets of the business. And we're just gonna highlight what moves the needle for your business. You know, it occurs to me that as you go about amassing big volumes of data and then you're slicing and dicing that and and reporting back on that to the client, you almost immediately would have to cross the line from kind of data gathering and analysis to PR consulting. I mean, isn't, isn't it, it's a slippery slope, isn't it, a little bit where you are actually I mean, I could see there might be a conflict of interest or some um, overlap with the role that the PR firm is supposed to be playing. Yeah, so we focus on highlighting the data that you might want to see. And this is why one, this is why our tagline for our PR analyst is humanizing data mm-hmm. to increase PR performance because it's almost like we're giving an analyst to you. And whether the you is the agency or the brand or both, It's really whoever is the one coming to us and saying, hey, we want analyst for us. And us could be the brand, us could be the agency on behalf of the brand. It's to give them the feeling that they have someone that understands both PR and understands analytics for the first time, combining those two together to say, here's the final result of what you're gonna wanna do. And here's the data to support that, to showcase how you've been, uh, how great your efforts have been thus far and how they can be even better. so if you're just joining us, just as a reminder to our audience, uh, I'm Doug Collum. I'm here with my co-host, Irene Yen. We're talking with the uh, CEO and founder of AirPR, Sharam Falagar Mercer. And uh, it's, a great, it's a great discussion because it's, I mean, frankly, it's an area of, I mean, you would not be surprised, Sharam, that Wharton has spent a lot of money and a lot of cycles in terms of its staff on how to market the brand, how to enhance you know, penetration into the communities that we want to address. I wonder if we could shift our focus a little bit and talk more about the company from a company management and company formation standpoint. So you're here in San Francisco. How many employees do you have? How is, tell us a little bit about the history of the company since it was formed in 2011. Sure. So originally, the the genesis of, uh, of AirPR I was looking for a technical co-founder. And so while I was a computer science undergrad and I can code, um, it's really hard to be a single founder. And it's really more effective to at least have a couple different folks um, starting the business. And an, a natural subdivision is tech versus non-tech. Right. And so there's also a shortage of really great technical resources in Silicon Valley as I've, well as everywhere I've else. heard about this. You've heard <laughs> the rumors. And so in order to find uh, a great technical co-founder, I ended up going to hackathon after hackathon. And so hackathons are places where you stay up for 48 hours straight and you'll and you'll build or you'll code a, a solution. You'll code uh, something that you think is going to be fun for people to use. It could be anything, a product, a feature, whatever it may be. And uh, at the end, it's just a fun way to get to meet people. Mm-hmm. And so I used to go to hackathon after hackathon and pull all-nighters every weekend, trying to find that person that was not just as good as me, but 10 times better than I was as a engineer. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I went to one and- You're here in San Francisco? Here in San Francisco, actually. And I met a guy named Raj and I made a suggestion of what we should build. And at the time it was a fun little project um, having to do with a thing called Kangaroo Court. And uh, it was just something that came out of sports teams. Right. And it was just a, a fun thing that I figured would be a great way to get to, to meet someone yeah. and build. Mm-hmm. And Raj, uh, I explained the project to Raj, and in my mind I figured it would take about 20 hours to build. And I asked Raj and he said it would take him about two. 
And I just assumed that uh, either I misspoke really? or um, or I misspoke. And so I asked him again, and he said the same thing. And pretty soon he just put his headphones on, and an hour, hour and a half later he was done. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This is... This is unbelievable, and and there are there are folks like this that just have this amazing ability to build things and think about the world in a very different way, and Raj is like that, and so ended up finding Raj that way. Had a same conversation with him. His background is he had a bachelor's in computer science from the mm -hmm. uh, uh, Birla Institute of Technology in India. Mm -hmm. Got a master's in mathematics. He was a technical director at DreamWorks and then got a master's at Stanford in computer science. So one of these really underqualified guys. Yeah, it sounds like you had all the credentials. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very, very underqualified guy. And uh, we, were, we were pulling him out of Zynga at the time. And I said, Raj, who do you think is the smartest person you've worked with? And he said, there's this guy named Patrick uh, Liang who is so smart, he kind of makes my head spin. And since Raj does that to me, figured he'd be a great guy to, uh, to join as well. So Patrick is our chief architect, Raj is our chief technology officer, and Rebecca, who I talked about, who started one of the fast growing companies in the PR space, uh, became our chief strategy officer. And the four of us formed the founding team uh, to build Air PR and really understand both the customer standpoint and have this crazy tech that took over two years to build because we processed through 10 terabytes of data a day through all of these different millions and millions of different uh, sources of content to be able to measure the impact and the uh, measure the impact of PR. So fast forward, talk about fin financing for the company. So you formed it in 2011. Mm -hmm. You had your four co-founders. All four of you guys came together about that time. You started kind of building product and starting started trying to figure out how the company was going to go forward. At some point, there is a there's an understanding. Hey, we need money to make this thing grow. <laughs> oh, that right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, the money. I, I've heard about that problem. Yeah, going so, concern, right? Yeah. So ended up going to raise a seed round at the time, and uh, back in 2012, a traditional seed round was a million dollars. Now they're. The, Eight million. Yeah, they're they're, they're, they're completely outsized. Yeah. Uh, they they range pretty widely right now, um, but ended up going to go raise that round and said, you know, we need a phenomenal team to be able to do that, and so that's what led to the genesis of creating that. And um, when we raised our million dollars, we pitched. Uh, not a lot of angels. We actually pitched uh, a, a few different VC firms. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because my background, I came from the VC world and I didn't know a lot of angels. Cause I was, was going to ask whether all your networking from previous years had helped in this in, in this seed round exercise. Yeah. And so it really hadn't because at the time, venture capitalists or venture capital firms didn't invest. They didn't do seed deals. Right. They invested in Series A companies. And so as a result, it was a new world that I was reaching out to, to angels that I didn't know. And here and there, there'd be VC firms that were thinking about doing seed deals. And so as a result, it would take even longer than you might imagine yeah. a traditional deal taking. And so it was, it was an exercise in frustration when I tried to raise the round. And if you combine that with the team was just getting together for the first time, mm -hmm. um, we didn't have an industry that people had invested in before. So the venture capitalists traditionally had never invested in anything in PR. PR tech didn't even exist. So you're trailblazing to boot. Yeah, we're trailblazing to boot. So it was an industry they, that no one invested in. It was a team that was just, um, we all clearly had a lot of experience, but we, I insisted on people not leaving their jobs until I could raise the round. Right. And so it was a combination of different factors that m made this a struggle. And I didn't really know who the right people to reach out to because I didn't know the angels. And so all of those together made it very difficult to go raise the round uh, at the time. How it, long did that take to raise that round of seed financing? That round probably took, I'd say, about four months. And I remember vividly because I ran out of cash personally at one point. And huh. uh, I, I, was, I was trying to figure out ways to be able to sustain myself. And ended up going through the process of a lot of my friends were either consultants or investors themselves. And as a result, they would go to the airport and expense it for $60. And so I would drive them to the airport and they would give me the $60. And you know, halfway through this process, ended up um, turned to one of my friends and said, wouldn't it be great if you had an app that could just call people like me and drive you wherever you wanted to go? <laughs> wow. And and my friends were like, that's the stupidest idea you've ever come up with. And I'm like, yeah, that is pretty dumb. You're right. Um, and, so, uh, and so ultimately- I'm sure I'm, you missed it. Yeah, exactly. And so ultimately, uh, we raised the round. Um, 
and had some really phenomenal, uh, phenomenal venture capital firms in there uh, that have that have been wonderful. And as part of the seed stage, as part of the seed stage, had some really great. So we had uh, more David Al Ventures. We had Correlation uh, Ventures. Oh, yeah. We had. Uh, um, we had Dave McClure uh, investing mm-hmm. money. We had the founder of WordPress, Matt Mullenweg, uh, invest money. Uh, had Crosslink Capital uh, mm-hmm. invest money. So Crosslink led the round, actually. And and this is all part of the million dollar seed round. All part of the million wow. dollar seed round. And so it was a yeah. very unique way because again, I didn't know a ton of angels, so I managed to convince VCs to put in a smaller chunk <laughs> right. of capital than uh, than normal. And so fast forward, ultimately, then we build the product. It took a couple years got some phenomenal customers and went to go raise our round and our series a and our series a we raised in less than seven days That's amazing. Yeah, which was on amazing. this on the strength of the connections from your seed your angel and your seed round investors Did they all reinvest so they all reinvested but it was a it was a confluence of both the pain behind pr was starting to become prevalent people understood that there was no measurement in the industry. And so the pain point was really relevant to anyone that had started a business and a lot of venture capital, uh, a lot of venture capitalists had done that in the past. And so understood that now. And, uh, and it was the customers. And so when you have these phenomenal customers to be able to show a product that was working, customers loving it and touching it, uh, and using it all of that together, um, led to the ability to be able to raise around very, very fast. It's called That's validation. Amazing, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which was, Huge validation. which was a very different, uh, very different as then we went to raise our seat. So, so just to ask the Frank question and we're on the air, it's live. <laughs> has, has the, the way you run the company, has it changed or did it change at the time you, you brought in institutional investors? Uh, presumably some of them are sitting on the board. You've got it around, you've got a group of institutional investors, does the culture of the company change when you went from that seed round into the Series A round? Yeah, it does. And frankly, I think it does for the better. So what's really interesting is that I would only have that perspective if I thought I had phenomenal investors that were supportive of our business, and we do. So Brian Stolley, who is the general partner at uh, at More David Out Ventures, both the firm and Brian have been phenomenal to work with. So Brian started three businesses himself, all of either um, M&A uh, or IPO'd. And so he is just a very large uh, knowledge base. Great for, resource. Yeah, great resource to yeah. start a company. And he understands a lot of the pain that companies might go through, but understands the PR aspect too, because he's done this three different times. And it's, it's that aspect of it where in a seed round, traditionally, you're doing what's called a convertible note, you don't have a board, you don't have oversight. And so better or not, for, for better or worse, however entrepreneurs want to want to position it, having a board pushing you, as long as you have the right people on that board and, they, and you know they're supportive and you know they are smart, is only going to help the company. Mm-hmm. The problem that a lot of entrepreneurs face is there are some venture capitalists that are a little shady in their practices. And if that's the case and they sit on their board, they can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. But the key is finding the right resource because there's a lot of money out there in Silicon Valley now, but finding the right support uh, and finding the right resource from uh, the right firm can really make or break your firm. And it gives us the flexibility to say, yeah, while it has changed, it's changed for the better. That's great. When you got the Series A funding and you closed that, how many customers did you have at the time? And the reason why I ask is this has come up before where a VC, a venture capitalist will say, we'd like to see 10 minimum, or an entrepreneur will ask. I don't know how many. We have you know, three big names, Coca-Cola, you know, McDonald's, I don't know who else, or 10, just revenue. We see revenue coming in. Where were you guys at at that point? Yeah, so we had uh, we had a few customers at the time. Uh, we had more than a few, but the, the real genesis that allows you to be able to raise a round is the ability to show a product that is working and the customers that are using it, they're paying customers and that they are actually engaged in using it. You know, it's not a friend of a, it's not a, it's not a friend that has a reciprocity agreement with you because they bought your product and you bought theirs and they agreed to be a reference. It's someone that you have reached out to, whether it's, you know, two or three fortune 100 brands, or it is uh, 10 really small companies. It's really to be able to show the potential mm-hmm. saying, Hey, we believe that we're going to be able to charge this amount of money. And look, here are the clients or here are the customers that are paying for it. Call them all. Mm-hmm. You guys feel free to call all of them as references. And that allows you the ability to both raise the round, but also 
command the terms that you think are reasonable because it's not just an exercise in you going out and saying, I need money. I don't really know where the business is going. It's saying, we have customers. We know why we win the deal. We know why we lose the deal. And so this money that we're going to raise from you is going exactly to this part of sales and marketing. Here, here's the hiring that's going to occur. And here's how the next 18 months look. Mm -hmm. And here's how we're going to scale with that capital. Well, that makes a lot of sense. It totally makes a lot of sense. Also, how, how many employees do you have now? You mentioned when you started your co-founder team, you went through a lot of pain and excitement, I guess, finding going through the hackathon. So how big are you guys right now? Yeah, we're about 15 employees right now. So scale pretty quick. So from a culture standpoint, as you you know started your culture, you have your core team, how do you maintain that culture as you onboard folks and the level of folks that you brought on board sound like you know A-plus players, that sort of thing? How yeah, so the it? culture is one of the things we spend a lot of time on. Rebecca, in, in, in particular, spends a lot of her time on that. And it's a really hard problem because when I was at AVC, we saw at least 50% of the reasons why companies would fail would be team issues. Mm. That is an enormously high number. And... It was really interesting because Lou Gershner, who used to run IBM, would give this talk where he'd just draw a two by two matrix on the board. And on one side of the matrix is cultural fit, right? Mm -hmm. Whether people like the person and they're a good person to work with. And the other side is talent. You know, how brilliant is the person? And the bottom left and top right quadrants are really easy decisions. You know, on one end, the person is a jerk and they're not smart, yeah. right? So that's an easy decision to figure out what to do. And the top right, it's easy because they're brilliant and everybody loves the person. Um, and there was one quadrant that was really, really hard and took 20 years by his own volition to figure out. Uh, and it was the person is brilliant. They are absolutely brilliant, but they ruin the culture. Hmm. They are a complete jerk to work with. They tear apart the people that believe in your company. They're always trying to take things in a completely different direction and they just care about themselves. And Pretty toxic. Yeah, yeah it's just toxic. Yeah. And no matter what, while you think it's gonna be beneficial for the short term of the business, it never helps from a long-term perspective and ultimately ends up ripping apart the company. And so from day one, we've just had this motto that no matter what, we refuse to hire people like that. And throughout our hiring process, there are, there are different things that we do and different ways that I approach those conversations just to see how candidates will react, uh, what kind of, of questions they ask, what is important to them. And based on that, and everyone on the team spends time with them. And no matter what, I spend time with them. Uh, it doesn't matter how busy I am or not. Everyone spends time with them so we can get an informed assessment about whether they're going to be a fit for us, both culturally as well as from a talent perspective. And so we spend a lot of time from that uh, from that culture perspective, as well as doing team events that help bring the team together. So horseback riding we've done as a team. We d <laughs> we uh, we took the whole team on a on a trip um, uh, to Las Vegas after we had the acquisition of one of our products, which was a lot of fun. Uh, coming up uh, pretty soon, we have a DJ that's going to come that teaches everyone how to DJ, uh, which would be a fun <laughs> team event. So just looking forward to doing a, a variety of different things to uh, make sure the team's bonding together. We'll bring you back when you DJ. We'll have an air. <laughs> PR like you know track. That's right. That sort That's of thing. right. Um, you know, I can't believe we're out of time, um, but we are. And I just wanted to um, share with our listeners that our guest this hour has been Sharam Fulad Gurmercer, the co-founder and CEO of ARPR. Sharam, thank you so much for joining us today thank you, really and taking the time it. to speak with us. Um, to find out more information about Sharam and ARPR, where should folks go? AirPR.com is a, is our landing page or website, and our blog is where you can get most of our content that's actually written by Rebecca, our chief strategy officer, and that's at blog.